Do we have any nominations for chair, please? That's Councillor Walsh. Does anybody second that nomination? So the nomination is seconded. Thank you very much. If Councillor Walsh wants to take the chair. Thank you. As much for my benefit as uh, anyone else's, I think it would be helpful if we uh, just went around the room and uh, in did some introductions. So shall we start uh, to my left, far end? Uh, John Connor Lyons, Councillor in Manchester, yeah. Councillor Liam Billington, Thameside Council. Councillor Mike Glover, Thameside. Barbara Branch, Councillor for Oldham. Uh, Matt Berry from the CA's Governments and Scrutiny Team. I'm Joanne Heron, I'm the Statutory Scrutiny Officer. I'm John Walsh, Councillor from Bolton. Councillor Linda Robinson, Rochdale. Substitute Member, Councillor Ray Dutton, Rochdale. Councillor Mandy Shilton, Godwin, Manchester, Labour, since nobody seems to think I should mention that. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Janet Mobs from Stockport. Steve Warren, I'm the Finance Director from Transport for Greater Manchester. Kevin Lee, Director of the Mayor's Office. Uh, item three is the appointment of a Vice Chair. It is uh, in line with the Chairmanship to be a member of a party in opposition to the Mayor. And can I therefore propose uh, Stephen Gribbon? I think, given the spirit in which we want to conduct these things, Fred, it's appropriate. Thank you. Item four is a complete list of membership. You note that. Item five, the code of conduct. This has been circulated previously and is there for note. Members are asked to uh, confirm that they subscribe to that. Along with it, item six, the annual declaration of interest, to which we all become accustomed in many guises. And again, if those could be returned, please, if you've not already done so. Uh, item seven, the terms of reference for this committee. They are there to be noted. I think we alluded to them at the previous meeting. Um, items one to seven are basically the business we would have done had the uh, previous meeting taken place. If you recall, we were not quartered on that occasion. So, well, they, they, they should have been circulated again. I accept that. Okay, thank you. Item eight, declaration of interest. None have been received. Are there any additional declarations of interest that anyone wishes to table? Thank you. Can we just clarify about the... Just thinking if we clarify that one, because there's obviously a declaration of interest in what one we don't. Uh, likewise, but... Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, there's a few leaders who have the pass as well who will be taking the eventual. We wouldn't class that as a as an interest. You're here representing your the interests of your constituents, so that's okay. fine. Uh, 
<coughs> I have been asked if we could uh, bring forward an item, uh, and that was the one which was uh, circulated early this week, the uh, local concessionary uh, travel charge. Um, and I propose, therefore, that we deal with that item uh, now, uh, members in agreement. Officers need to be aware, and I'm conscious of that fact. And given the importance of it and the fact it was, it was circulated rather late, I want to do justice to that particular item. So we'll take item uh, 12 on the agenda next, please. Chairman, would you like me to introduce that report? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the, the report that you have uh, in, in front of you is uh, a cover report to a draft report uh, that is on the agenda for the combined authority uh, at the end of July. Um, what we are seeking from members this evening is comment on that report uh, that is going to the committee. The report seeks approval to introduce an annual charge for older people, that definition uh, being in paragraph uh, 1.2 of the report, and that charge is to access the local concessionary travel scheme, uh, which enables free travel within GM on Metrolink trams uh, between 9.30 and midnight, uh, Monday to Friday and all day to weekend, and on train journeys uh, that run at or after 9.30, and again, um, same as tram at weekends and on public holidays. Um, mem members are also uh, asked to note that um, introducing that pass based on the experience of the northeast of England, uh, i.e. the Transport Authority Nexus, that is clearly uh, in a different part of the country, in a different demographic, when they introduced something similar, that, uh, that resulted in approximately 30% of people taking up um, or, or paying the charge uh, to continue to lose, use the local concession. Um, the financial uh, forecast that's in here, the 1.25 million, is based on a similar percentage, uh, albeit um, the only certain thing is it probably won't be exactly 30, um, but that's the best estimate that we've got to benchmark at the moment. Um, the proposal um, is that uh, that funding... Uh, once generated would be ring-fenced for uh, investment in particular around uh, the bus network and subsequent bus reform. Um, the proposal that is also set out in the report is that subject to comments from members and approval, subsequent approval by the combined authority, uh, that del a delivery plan will be worked up. Our best estimate subject to agreement uh, is that we would be able to launch the scheme in January. That would generate uh, three months' worth of income in this current financial year. And the proposal is that the cost of implementing such a scheme, the members will be aware there are some technical elements and there's a number of bus business process changes we need to make, uh, that those costs would be paid for from a top slice from the first year, i.e. the remainder of this year's income. Um, the report, excuse me, the report subsequently sets out um, some detail uh, around the legislative background. Uh, members may be aware that um, the national concession scheme that is limited to bus, uh, that the legislation does not allow us to charge for that pass uh, to be issued. Um, it also sets out the charges that are already uh, levied to pass holders, predominantly for the IGO pass and the proposals in relation to the R pass uh, that are also um, for £10 for issue. Um, the proposal, as I iterated earlier, is that we introduce an annual charge um, from, um, as I say, subject to, um, to, to, to approval um, from uh, probably around about uh, the 1st of January. The delivery of it is uh, different between tram and rail. Uh, those members who use the tram network uh, and those members who've got a concessionary pass uh, will be aware uh, that, um, that you 
tap off and on, or on and off, uh, at the validators. Um, currently, to the extent that um, concessionaires purchase, the, the access to the tram and train, they'll continue to do that. Um, for rail, it's different because the, the, the rail stations aren't all gated in a way that some of the, some of the major stations are. So we're looking at a workaround that will probably be used in the past as some sort of flash pass uh, initially whilst the rail industry uh, becomes more smart enabled. Uh, the, the final element of the report uh, summarises that we have undertaken, uh, as we would for any uh, policy decision like this, an equalities impact uh, assessment. Uh, we've also undertaken... Um, well, well, sorry, we have undertaken a public sector equality, or sorry, under the auspice of the public sector equality duty, and whilst recognising that there is clearly a small adverse variance, adverse impact uh, on the protected characteristics of age, i.e. Um, to the extent this deals with older people as defined, uh, the longer term benefit of having unlimited off-peak travel on Metrolink and rail, uh, within GM is deemed under that assessment to be significantly more beneficial for the cardholders. Um, and I think it's important that, that, that we just reinforce that, which probably isn't quite as well reinforced in the body of the report as it otherwise could have been. Very happy to take questions. Question, comments? Yeah. Andy, thank you. Um, when you say that the take up in next through nexus had been 30 percent do you mean that the take up of the card was 30 percent of the eligible population yes so those people who um who have or who had in nexus a pass um that gave them a similar concession clearly slightly different because of a different network uh, in, in the northeast 30 percent of the people who had the pass took up the option to pay, it was actually £12 in the North East, uh, to pay £12 to allow them to continue to, to, to use their, uh, the other public transport network beyond the bus. So th there's a population here, as there was in the North East, who had the pass. Um, those people who paid the £12 it was and the proposal here for the £10 uh, would be able to use the tram and rail. Those that don't want to use the, the tram or rail in some instances can't don't pay anything and they continue using the bus for free as uh, as, oh, as no. is currently the case yeah so then yeah so then my sort of question is how does that compare with the number of people that current the num the proportion of the eligible population that currently have a pass i mean obviously that's how many people have the how many people what percentage of the eligible population have a pass now that's in greater manchester that's a very good question i can tell you the number of people that have a pass um what i can't recite back to you is what percentage of the population who are eligible for a pass have a pass but we can certainly find that out subsequently so apologies so there's something um in the order of 400 and odd thousand people um who have who have a pass some of them clearly have a pass and don't use it. Some of them have a pass and use it regularly. Again, um, <clears throat> I do apologise. Uh, I found the report a little bit confusing. And basically on the point that you've just made. Okay. <laughs> so if I ask a very basic question, I've got a pass. Okay. If I, don't if I don't wish to enhance it to use the train or whatever... I can still carry on using my pass as it is on, on, on Metrolink and on the buses? No, so to oh. the extent that you currently have a pass and you uh, want to continue to use it on a bus, there is absolutely no charge payable to the extent that you wish to continue using it on either tram and or rail, then the £10 charge would apply. So I can't use it on, sorry, can't use it on Metrolink? You couldn't unless you paid the £10. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm clear on that. Chair, I, I, I do have a number of other points, but I'm sure other people, and I'll, I'll come back later. 
Thank you, Chair. A number of issues. We've already been penalised that we can't use the bus before 9.30. And for people that need to get to hospital appointments at 10 o'clock, they're still having to pay because they can't use the bus pass before half past nine. So as far as I'm concerned, anybody with an illness going to a hospital is already penalised. Now he wants us to pay um, to um, improve somebody else's transport, which a lot of people won't be using. Um, I also feel, well, to be honest, I've been the champion, older person's champion for 16 years where I live. If I voted for this, they would hang, drawn and quarter me. I'm totally against it. It's, it's getting at pensioners again. What else are they going to take off us? And, and it's not just that. Some of these people we're targeting have been through a world war and that they're expected to have a bit of dignity and some help along the way. And many of them are even struggling to, to heat the homes and eat, let alone pay to, to, to go on transport. So I'm sorry, I feel very, very strongly about this and I won't be voting for it. Um, I, I would go along with, with what Councillor Robinson has said. I have a lot of reservations about this. Um, there's, a no, there's a lot of elderly people who, well, one of the main questions I would, well, one of the main questions, what I was going to say, although it doesn't apply to buses, there are a lot of elderly people who need to get out of their houses and we encourage them to get out of their houses and so on, and they tend to become isolated. Yeah. Um, as has already been said, these people have worked, all, and, well, the majority of them have worked all their lives. They've paid tax, they've paid national insurance all their lives. They're going to be confronted with, with, with having to pay for the television and radio license and so on, which is a, over 100 pounds, over 100 pounds. And um, I will be voting against this too. Thank you, Chair. I've got some serious reservations about this. Last week, I was sitting on an Adult Social Care and Health Scrutiny Committee in Stockport, and we were talking about, um, with health care professionals, about the development of area-based specialist centres. Fantastic in terms of health care provision for specialist conditions, but it has to go hand in hand with transport access. And one of the major groups of users of these centres are likely to be older people and unless they can access their, their specialist hospitals they won't be taking up their appointments and in Stockport in particular although it, it has an image of, of being a very nice leafy Cheshire suburb with people like Paul Pogba living on the doorstep mm. it also has some areas of high deprivation and those are the people who have a shorter life expectancy who have um, poorer quality of health during their lives and are less likely to take up this opportunity to have an enhanced pass. So I think it is, it, it is um, problematic on those grounds and somewhat contrary to some of the developments taking place and being discussed in, in, in health circles. The other aspect of it is, as you just mentioned there, Councillor Gunter, without access to public transport, some older people will become isolated. That isolation will lead to mental health problems. And again, we know that that's a service that is becoming into crisis. And I, and I don't think we should be looking at anything that, that increases isolation and the risk of mental health. There are also young people who, de who depend on transport in order to get to jobs and to access leisure. And I do really think that we need to be very careful about increasing any costs and I have to say as a waspy woman I don't have any free concessionary transport anywhere thank you thank you chair uh, I just wonder if any consideration had been if you're going to charge someone 10 pound what you're giving them back rather than take it away then re remove the 9 30 uh, concession start and um, I just wonder if that had been considered then uh, some of our old age pensioners me included can travel coming to these meetings at 10 o'clock in the morning without having to pay £2.80 from Bowker Vale. If it was a, so, and, and certain things like this. So, you know, if you're going to put a charge on, what are you giving me for the charge? I just wonder if that had been considered, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, 
Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I see why people aren't keen, but when you look that it's costing £7.5 million to administer this scheme, it's, that's all dead money, isn't it? Would it be possible to clarify what this actually means? Because we're sort of talking like if this is taken away that nobody will be able to go anywhere, and obviously we've still got a bus network. So I think it would be helpful to have information about how accessible some of these places that people are talking about, hospitals, central you know, pods for whatever it might be that people need to access, how good the bus service is, because we know the bus services have been slashed all over the place. So I think we need to be reassured that there is a viable alternative before we actually confirm this one way or another. Yeah, first I want to clarify an enhanced pass. At the moment, the pass provides for buses, Metrolink, trains, uh, so I don't really understand what the enhancement is. The tram and the, and the tram and the train is an enhancement that Greater Manchester offers us. That's not what we're entitled to under the Oh, right, but we've already got it. We've already been given right. that. Yes. So, in terms of this report, it's not enhancing anything I've already got. We're all enhanced already. The other we're already paying for it, uh, primarily by a lever on, levy on Greater Manchester Council taxpayers, so we're already paying for this anyway. But it's paid for by the greater population. Uh, so to start ta targeting older people again, like the TV licence and all the rest of it, politically it's, an, it's not a good idea. Uh, personally, it doesn't make a lot of difference for £10 a year, but I can understand that there's a lot of older people where it will make a lot of difference. And if they have to get hospital appointments and pay £2, £4, whatever every time, purely because they haven't paid the £10 up front, it could be quite painful. Thank you. Again, thank you. Of course, there are many older people for whom £10 is, is not a significant sum, and that's... No. But for many people, it really is and we don't we we I, I feel like we haven't got the information about how many people you expect who currently have a pass not to get one which is the key issue it seems to me that if we're looking at this strategically from a transport and environmental point of view the two key things are here um getting cars off the road so that people prefer to use the bus because and, and that's that's a, a, a financial benefit to the greater manchester ultimately as well as um, reducing congestion. It's also using unused capacity, isn't it, on, on Metrolink and stuff because um, trams are not as busy during the day. So there isn't actually kind of a cost to those journeys in all, in all honesty. It's a sunk cost. Those, those trams are running anyway. Um, but I think that the, the key thing about this is it's the message that it sends to people about how, how much you think it's important to enable them to be mobile. And personally, I do think it's incredibly important to allow people to be mobile all over, all over the conurbation. So I'm, I'm really not in favour of it at all. And if it's unavoidable, then I think that it should not be charged to people who, have to, who get council tax support. Right, thank you, Chair. Um, it's already been said across there about... Um, are we going to get anything more enhanced? As far as I'm concerned, I'm happy with the free bus pass, providing the buses turn up. When I've, I've been on this committee now from day one, and I think there was one committee meeting where I thought I wasn't going to get to, because I'd been waiting for a bus for over 50 minutes, as supposed to be every 10 minutes. So I will not want to pay any extra for a service that's incompetent, they don't turn up, and when they turn up, they're overpacked, even with a disability. Sometimes I can't get to sit down because there's other people with disabilities already on the bus because it's overcrowded and they're dirty. They, you can get on and they smell because they haven't been cleaned properly. Now, they want us to pay an extra £10 <coughs> for something that's not even competent enough at the moment in regards to the buses. And I still have very great concerns about people that have ho hospital appointments early in the morning and this does not send a message out to the pensioners in our country that work hard for us across Greater Manchester that, that we don't think any better of them. 
can I just put one final point and then invite you to respond? And that is uh, my concern about the administration of this, because currently the past is a five-year pass. You're talking about here about an annual charge, and therefore we're talking about having to presumably reissue and administer a £10 charge. What is the administrative cost of recovering £10? Because my fear is that uh, it may well be almost the uh, sum total of the £10. But uh, your observations, please, on that. Thank you. Um, if I can just make, just to completely clarify what, what the proposal entails um, and then maybe try and um, re respond to some of the specifics. So the proposal absolutely isn't to uh, make any charge for those people who um, use their concessionary pass to travel by a bus. And I think the report sets it out, even if we thought that was a good idea, that the legislation doesn't enable us to, to do that. What we're talking about uh, is, to, um, is to levy a £10 charge f uh, per year for those people who currently get and um, take in the, the, the councillor's uh, comments on board, probably slightly unclear. What we talk about by way of an enhancement is that the national concessionary scheme, which is for bus travel after 9.30, is um, a, uh, a policy that was introduced um, across the country, across England and Wales, uh, and we effectively administer that on behalf, um, on behalf of central government. Um, what, the, what, what Greater Manchester has done is enhanced that scheme, if you will, uh, or, or it enables people who currently get the car to travel on train and tram. What this is saying is that, in, in practice, um, that to the extent that people pay £10, that pass will be eligible on a tram or a train. To the extent that they don't, then it wouldn't. Um, in terms of uh, the, the costs Sorry, so to the extent it generates 1.25 million, what we've included within the report um, is the proposal that that funding would be ring fenced for bus services. So I, I know um, a, a couple of uh, m members uh, mentioned bus, so that so the, the proposal, um, and Kevin maybe wish to say some more around it, um, is that the, the funding that was raised would go towards bus services. Um, which would be an extra, assuming the numbers of take-up are what we forecast, uh, would be an extra 1.2 million, so roughly, uh, on top of the current subsidised services bus budget that's round about £27 million, uh, that, again, members will be aware has been significantly under pressure for a, for, for a number of years. So this would be incremental funding into bus. Um, in terms of how many people uh, might not might get one, um, uh, again, difficult to forecast. There are a number of people who clearly haven't got access to Metrolink uh, for purely practical reasons, because of their but because of where they live, uh, and there are a number of people who have who choose to use the bus over um, over tram or train anyway for various reasons. Um, in terms of the cost of it. Uh, the 7.5 million, we effectively apply a charge in the same way that we do for bus on the basis of sort of equity, for want of a better expression, across the various modes of transport. So to the extent uh, that we um, reimburse bus operators for the trips that are made by concessionaires, be, be the elderly or children uh, or disabled passengers, we, we make a similar charge if you like, to Metrolink, and we make a similar payment um, to, to the rail operators for tram uh, and and for uh, and, and for train as well. I think that the um, the, the councillor, uh, sorry, I apologise, I haven't brought my glasses with me, so I can only see the, the names of, of councillors that are uh, that are near councillor mobs in in terms of the WASPI. Uh, you be aware, I'm sure, that there is a scheme um, that was launched a bit over a year ago now um, for, um, for we haven't called it the WASPI scheme, but that's what it's known as colloquially. Um, so to the extent that you haven't got a pass for that, uh, more than happy to talk to you later and make sure that if to the extent you're eligible for one, that you can get one. 
It isn't all waspy. You know, there, there are certain wasp, waspy women. Yeah. <laughs>
where we've enhanced it to include tram and train as well. And just to be absolutely clear with members, that we are not talking about any charge at all for bus usage. That remains completely free through this whole scheme. The additional £10 that we're asking for is for those older people who wish to enhance that bus opportunity to be able to use the Metrolink and the trains. Um, I think we just need to be clear about that because it is not going to inhibit many of our older people in terms of um, issues around isolation or hospital appointments unless they already use the tram or train in particular to get there because they will still be able to use the bus services. And I think it's important as well to note that the report is very clear that the money that is raised through this particular scheme is to go back into bus reform. So where um, some, some councillors have commented about the poor standard of buses, actually because we can't charge as it were, for that enhanced, uh, for that concessionary scheme for buses, this gives us an ability to charge for the enhancement, and that money can actually go back into bus reform, and therefore potential enhancement of the bus services as well. Um, in terms of uh, Councillor Walker's point, which is a good one about how precisely will this money will be spent, well, first of all, um, the combined authority has to agree the scheme, and then that will go through the budget process um, for the combined authority, which will be set out to members um, and to the combined authority, which will then detail all the various budget headings and how the money is going to be spent. It's not possible to do that at this stage of the cycle because, first of all, we need to reach agreement. Um, as Steve has said, we also need to know what numbers of people potentially take this up, so how much money will potentially be raised, but that will then go into the budget cycle process, so committee members will all be cited on that when it comes through. Views on the matter which have been noted. Is it uh, your wish that uh, those comments now be uh, attached to the report? Councillor Robinson? I'd like my, my comments noted that I am against this totally. A number of the members expressed that view and uh, that will be included. Members happy that uh, that is a response that we send back? And Councillor Walker's point about uh, yeah. more detail of the enhancements. Someone else asked, but I'm still, I didn't clearly reply. Uh, that I'm not sure clearly. Your bus pass lasts for four or five years. So, n someone asked how much that was going to cost. Right, OK. Well, I couldn't remember who, but I thought it was a really important question because if I find out that half the, half the money is going to cover the admin, then, then it, it becomes a mockery, doesn't it? Correct. Yeah. No. What, I mean, it's £10 now, but what guarantee... Sorry. What, what guarantee would there be that it would stay at £10. It could be enhanced and it could increase and, you know. Yeah, so um, just in response to the how much will it cost, so again, members will be aware that the, the, the renewal of the passes is on a rolling basis. So it was first introduced, I was around, it was first introduced in 2008 when there was a sort of a big bang launch and uh, all, all eligible people uh, applied for the pass. And we actually did get some money from central government at that time from memory to actually help us with the implementation. Uh, subsequently, the passes are renewed on a rolling basis, albeit there's sort of rumps in some years beyond others. Um, to the extent that uh, the command authority agrees that we proceed with this, our estimate is that the vast majority of additional costs can just be absorbed in what we're doing around renewing the passes. The practical reality is that there is, and I'm no technical expert, so apologies, there's effectively already a chip in, so, th so those colleagues, th those members who've, who've got a card, they are already smart enabled. So if you travel on the tram at the moment, you tap on the validators, which I'm sure you all do, and tap out. All we do is effectively load a product on there that says, 
um, Mr. or Mrs. or Miss X has paid ten pound. It then it then recognises it. How are we? How practically are we going to charge them um, in the same way that we currently charge those young people um, who, who, who pay the IGO card? So what we can make that clearer. What is the calculation of the cost benefit in terms of cost of collection against the benefit of receipt? My Have you got that calculation? In your I haven't context? got the detail, but I can assure you that the costs are marginal and the benefit is the 1.25 million based on a 30% take up in terms of incrementally marginal. So we've got people who are processing cards, uh, be it the IGO card, be it subsequently the Hour Pass card. What we're not suggesting is that we need a whole load of more people to do that. We need some system changes and business process changes. And what we're saying is that to the extent there is an additional cost, they will be covered by what we describe as a top slice of the first three months to the extent we introduce it in January from April 2020. That, that there's no incremental cost beyond the fact that we've got people doing this already. But yeah, but have you got the capacity already? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to labour this point, but it, it does concern me that you have, will have 150,000 or whatever the figure may be yeah. of people who decide to top up their card. Are yeah. you going to send me an invoice every year to pay my £10 to administer my £10 and send me my new card? And <laughs> what is the cost of that process? Of the reminder the receipt well, yeah. and the re-release re uh, re re of the card. I haven't got a detailed breakdown of the cost, Councillor. However, um, the uh, and t to be honest with you, nor can I recount the, the process in absolute detail, not least of all because we haven't validated, but we haven't worked through the detail of it. But it will be a simple process in the same way um, that. Um, that, that, that those older, el older people are currently applying for cards and we've got a big population of people uh, and an even bigger population now with the launch of our pass where people are, are, are paying £10 to access a card. So I am not expecting that there is any more cost beyond, in the, in the absolute margins, it'll just be absorbed within our, our, our current resources. What I couldn't describe to you now, but I'm more than happily come back, um, with, with somebody far more informed than I about the actual detail of that process. Yeah, thank but you. I'm certainly not, exp what we are absolutely not saying is that it's 1.25 million less a number that we haven't described to you. We're not saying that. Thank you. I'm going to take one final comment yeah. and then we need to draw this. Uh... It's to follow on what your comments are, Chair, because now I've got an even further um, concern. It's bad enough sometimes that pensioners have to fill in a form to get their bus pass now. In future, they're going to have to give the bank details, and some pensioners don't deal with their own banking system. They have family members or carers that do that for them. So every year now, somebody's going to have to go to the bank or make sure that they've got a receipt for that temper. I just, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Some pensioners do not like people interfering in their personal life, especially their own banking systems. So they will not go forward and ask for this new passport, passport yeah. uh, pass, um, for simple reason, it's an invasion of their privacy because you'll need the bank details. And then I'm going to draw this map to a close. Yes, yeah, sorry, just, just, to reassure, just to reassure the councillor um, in, in relation to the last point. Um, that we are clearly acutely aware um, of and having undertaken the equalities impact assessment that, that we've done. What we're not saying um, at, at the moment is that somebody will need to give us the bank details. There'll be various means of people paying, um, whether it be through travel shops, whether it be through, um, through checks or, 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 or various other means. Um, so what we're not saying is that um, we're absolutely not saying because we couldn't say it anyway because of GDPR regulations that people would be giving us the bank account details. Even if we wanted them to do that, we, we, we wouldn't. But I think we can certainly bring back, um, and I can bring back colleagues who uh, can go through in some detail the process that we'd go through in terms of, um, in, in terms of engaging, uh, in, engaging your constituents. Thank you very much, indeed. I think we've given it a thorough airing now. I think concerns have been articulated. 
uh, and those points will be made. Uh, there was one final point I would make from the Chair, that I do think the report is deficient in terms of that detail as to the administration and the methodology on that. And I think without that, it is virtually impossible to uh, pass a considered opinion other than to articulate the concerns that have been uh, set forward this evening. Members happy that that is the response that we will uh, provide. Thank you. Go on. I'll, 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 I'll be very... Uh, uh, this evening, I'm very easy with you. I'll give you another opportunity. Go thank, on. thank you, Chair. J just really to... Um, t just in response to what you said, what, what we're saying is that to the extent that the combined authority approved the proposal, then what we will absolutely need to do is to work up a detailed delivery plan that will take into account a lot of comments uh, and, and questions, all of which are extremely helpful uh, from members. No, sorry. This commits, a lot of our members around this table have not approved this. So where has it been approved already? And if that's the case, what on earth are you coming here for if it's already been done? As far as, I, yeah, but as far as I'm concerned, I haven't approved anything. Not approved it. This committee has noted the report and the comments that have been made will be added to that and sent forward with the, uh, of, of the scrutiny views. Okay, I'm just clear about that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you. We go back then to the agenda and to item nine. The Greater Manchester Strat Strategy Implementation Plan Performance Update. Thanks, Chair. I'll just do a very brief introduction because members have had this for quite a while. Um, when we produced the Greater Manchester Strategy in 2017, we committed to produce an implementation plan um, to set out the specific actions and activities that were ongoing to deliver our ambition. So last April, we agreed the two-year implementation plan that's um, attached um, to set out all the targets and ambitions to be achieved by 2020. So the document that you've got covers the period for October 18 to March 19 of this year with some milestones for delivery in the coming six to, and 12 months to October 2019 and March 2020. And it includes a RAG rating, as you'll see in the papers, on the likelihood of the actions being delivered by 2020. Sorry, it's bringing me to tears. I didn't know so. Um, just in paragraph 2.2, it highlights that this report has gone across all three scrutiny committees and the committees are asked to focus on the particular activities that fall under their remit. So for this, this committee, paragraph 2.2 sets out the particular areas that you might be interested in, in delving into in more detail. We did have a conversation um, at the prep preparatory meeting on the work programme as to what might inform areas that you might want to scrutinise in more detail over the next year. Um, and we've included those in the draft work programme elsewhere on the agenda. So it, it's for members to make comment, ask questions. We've got officers here, Anne Morgan and Steve Fife from Planning and Housing. We've got Steve Warrener from Transport. Um, we'll do our best to cover low carbon, but Mark Atherton is down to come to the next meeting um, to give people a presentation on the green agenda. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Observations? Uh, Councillor uh, Shilton Godwin. I know we've been directed to priorities four, six, and seven, but I. Um, have comments on priority five and I definitely think they're within the remit of this committee although I haven't got the terms of reference here um, because it's to do with connectivity that's to do with transport and therefore it's very closely related to um, to to the, to the carbon um, and clean air questions that are exercising us all enormously at the moment so I had first of all I had a query on the um, on the dashboard, because it says here, on, and it's on page 38, and in looking at the supporting indicators, that 55.3% of short journeys under two kilometres in Greater Manchester are completed by walking or cycling in 2015 to 2017. Now, 
that doesn't tally and I am the active travel lead for Manchester so I follow this extremely closely that simply does not tally with my knowledge of what people do at all my understanding of what people are doing is that they're in their cars for those journeys um, largely so I'm just asking if that can be reviewed because I just think that's not right and it bothers me that a figure that is so important isn't right and then going into the detail again on priority five about and I'm looking here at item 5.5 .5, and because I've got these in black and white I don't know what color it is um, but have commenced the significant investment of ref and reform program for cycling and walking um, what I'd like to ask about is that my understanding is now that nominally all of the um, all of the money that was first secured for the challenge fund 1.6 billion I think 1.6 whatever it was um, has now been allocated there's not very many schemes actually um, in the actually on the ground but but there are quite a lot sort of being worked up and it's, that's, that's understandable because it takes a long time for these things to come to fruition. But what I want to know is, are we already working on getting more money? Because, if we, because that money, in terms of the number of people and the footprint that Greater Manchester covers, is tiny. We know that we, as that's right, we, need, we, we know we need 10 times as much. So those, those are my queries on that priority. I'll leave Thank that. you. I think, Steve, you want to uh, respond to that? Yeah, just so on, on the first question, um, can I take that back? I've no, sorry, I've no reason to doubt whatsoever um, the veracity of the numbers. However, I haven't produced them myself, um, so I'd just like to go back and confirm. Um, around... Yeah, ap ap apologies. So I, I, I will confirm that. As I say, I'm not doubting, as I'm sure you're not, the veracity of them. I just need to go back and understand uh, where they've come from. Um, in terms of the cycling and walking programme, which I am far more familiar with, um, members will recall that uh, Chris Boardman, as the Cycling and Walking Commissioner, set out his, his vision, um, the, the, the made-to-move strategy, that suggested that um, there was a need of something in the order of 1.6 billion over a period. What happened um, over a year ago now, March 2018 from memory, was that um, the funding that Greater Manchester received from the Transforming Cities Fund, 160 million of that was allocated to the first phase, if you like, maybe the wrong words, um, of that program so what we have done uh, working with colleagues in districts uh, is to request that, lo that the local authorities bring forward uh, proposals uh, schemes um, which they've done currently in five tranches um, and that this is slightly out of date in that tranche five went through the combined authority in June what we now have is a effectively over-programmed program. So we've got schemes that have been given what we describe as program entry, which is an assessment by our technical teams that says, yes, these schemes have got legs. They need some further work done on them um, to, to build up a business case. Where we are now is we've got, mo we've got schemes that want more than the 160 million. So in the absence currently of any other specific funding source, and I'll come back to that in a second, um, we're going through with local authorities to review the schemes, to ensure that the costings are as accurate as they can be, to work to, to, to see whether there's any other funding sources that are available. To the extent that, that there are, then great. To the extent that they're not, then at the very worst, we will have schemes to the value of 160 million of funding need and a list of other schemes that are ready to go, um, subject to there being further funding. Um, and I know 
Chris Boardman uh, and the other cycling and walking commissioners who've been appointed um, across the, the, the other mayoral combined authorities uh, have made the point quite vociferously to government about the need for further funding. Um, it's one of a number of things. Members will be aware of the vision that the mayor set out, the Our Network vision, uh, a week uh, last Monday. That absolutely has active travel at the heart of it. <coughs> in addition to a number of other transport asks, be it around bus, rail, uh, and the like. Um, and I would be uh, not be in the slightest bit surprised if the comprehensive spending review submission that GM uh, put in doesn't include um, a, a significant ask around transport more generally, um, cycling and walking, active travel being a key part of that. So. I, th I think the, the other comment that you made was around the number of schemes that are on the ground. You're right, these things, some of them are quite complicated schemes, quite big schemes actually. I for one was somewhat surprised when you see the value of some of these schemes being a simple accountant. Um, and they are complicated. I think there's at least one scheme that's delivered, a scheme in Rochdale. Um, and there's a number of other schemes that are getting towards a final business case. Um, and it's, you know, it's groundbreaking stuff and quite complex stuff. We've got a number of people, uh, myself included, who've probably spent more time on this than we ever envisaged that we might. Um, but, but again, something that if, if, um, if members would wish, we can certainly get somebody uh, at a future meeting of this committee to come back and give a more detailed uh, update on, on where that's up to. But there's regular reporting goes through to, to, to leaders of the combined authority roughly um, every couple of months. Other members, any comments? Anything you wish to add to the report? Yes, Councillor Brownridge. Thank you. Can I just ask a question about the, the housing provision and about infrastructure, which is shown as amber on our RAG rating? Now, obviously, we know through our consultations on GMSF that infrastructure is one of the things that gets people really, really <coughs> excited, or the lack of it anyway. And I'm interested, as I say, influencing infrastructure providers. What does that actually mean? Thank you, Councillor Brownridge. Um, you are absolutely right that infrastructure is one of the biggest issues that come back to us every time. Um, so we've had um, a lot of concerted activity over the last 12 months to look at infrastructure differently. Um, we have established the Strategic Infrastructure Board, which has the infrastructure providers sitting on it. And I think the influencing is trying to work much more closely with them so that when they are putting together their investment programmes for the next five years and looking ahead the next 20 years, we know what they are and we're aligning them with our plans for growth or our issues where infrastructure may be particularly um, under pressure or at capacity. So it's the influencing it is difficult, it's a regulatory framework, it's hard to get into that, but I think we have got a willingness, particularly with the electricity and um, water providers, to work more closely, if we can, to align their investment programmes with ours. We are also looking to provide, um, to produce an infrastructure strategy with them, an action plan that starts to set out some of the actions that we are hoping will be, um, would lead to a a different way of providing infrastructure and trying to do it in a much more integrated way in the areas where we expect to see most change. But um, at the moment, we've got the infrastructure framework which sets out the challenges. The next bit is trying to say what we're going to do about them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's a supplementary question. That's all very, that, that's really encouraging. I mean, I'm seriously encouraging. I suppose the supplementary question is, what's the role of the actual developers of the housing in this? Because that's the strategic statutory bodies, that's fine. But where are we, or what influence, or what pressure are we putting on house builders to actually put their hands in their pockets rather than denying their responsibility because they can't afford anything? Not, you know. <laughs> so, so they have a contribution to this as well. And, and what influence are we bring to bear on them, I suppose? 
as part of the evidence base for the next spatial framework, we're doing a piece of work on viability, um, strategic viability in particular, which looks at how, um, how viable certain types of development are in certain places and what ability those sites have to provide infrastructure. You do this at a local level, you fight this um, when you get viability assessments on planning applications all of the time. The planning guidance changed last year and said we should do a viability assessment of the plan and therefore you shouldn't need to do, or developers shouldn't need to do viability assessments at planning application stage, which could be very helpful. So if we can demonstrate there is, there is viability on that site, it is much, much more difficult for the developer to say we shouldn't be providing anything towards roads or schools or health facilities. Obviously the change came in last year, this is the first time we're doing it. We do have some really significant viability issues across the conurbation, as in Oldham, I'm sure you're aware. <laughs> um, so that's a piece of work we're doing, and that will look really at our brownfield land supply. Where we're looking through the spatial framework to allocate land in the green belt or outside of the urban area, we're doing some site-specific viability work, which will again look at what, um, what level of infrastructure those sites can support from the developer side which side which sites we may need to look and say do we have to have some fun do we have to find some funding um elsewhere so i think we will be in a much better position but that is as you can imagine an enormous piece of work that we have only just started we're hoping we'll be have something to report sort of october time I wonder how we're going to monitor how pro progress is on, on those particular issues. <coughs> and then, a completely separate question, but only because it's been in the, the news recently, but <coughs> this business that <coughs> industrial units being converted into uh, housing units without planning permission, um, and I've not particularly come across it in Greater Manchester, but clearly it's a big issue in London, and some of our areas are getting very pricey now. Uh, and I just wonder whether that's an issue that we need to be keeping at least a weather eye on, but maybe more than that. Maybe, maybe we're already getting issues on that. I don't know. Are you? I think probably um, Councillor Shilton Godden has experience of this. Manchester, I think, um, has had pressure, particularly on old office or maybe second-hand office stock um, for conversion to residential and has been looking to put in place an Article 4 direction, which takes permitted de development rights away. Um, so anybody wanting to do that would need to apply for planning permission. It doesn't mean you can automatically refuse planning permission, but you would have to apply for it. We didn't really see very much activity, um, the conversions, particularly offices to housing. I think that is starting to change a little bit. I think Trafford has seen quite a lot. I think Stockport is starting to see it. We clearly have concerns about that because the, you know, in terms of the standard of accommodation that may result, it still does need building regs approval. But it's, I, I, I think there is a concern around what those units are actually providing what level of housing. I don't know whether Steve's had anything from housing colleagues, you know, whether that's coming out of the other end yet, but we are seeing more of that. If, you, if you'd asked us this two years ago, we really, uh, there was a site in, there was a Bruntwood scheme in Trafford. That was about it. It is starting to become um, more, um, more popular as I think as values increase not a lot we can do as the combined authority it is very much a local responsibility and i think article 4 direction is quite a quite a lot of work involved in doing it but that is one of the ways that at least you can retain some control by at least people have to apply for planning permission yes sorry there was a couple of other things that i I had noticed and asked about. Um, one's, I can't remember where I found it now, but there's something on the electric, oh yeah, page 47, priority 7, about the transport strategy, and I just 
um, wondered how the um, EV charging infrastructure was was progressing because I know it, it did get delayed and I wondered how many charging points there were supposed to be across the conurbation. I've not I've not read it and I did read somewhere that somebody was putting in about 80 in a vast swathe of the south of England and I just thought 80 that's not very ambitious I've got some more questions on homes re re retrofit as well but I don't know whether you want to take all the questions that are not related to each other together or whether you want to take them separately okay. questions and we'll deal with okay. them okay okay so and then Please. my other question was about on homes retrofitting If we are to meet our carbon reduction targets, then it's going to be absolutely essential that we have a proper program for retrofitting people's homes. And it's a huge benefit to people because we've got an awful lot of people living in fuel poverty or living in homes that are cold and damp and not properly insulated. And also the, the cost of fuel is, is massively going up. I think it's 27% of the carbon emission in the whole conurbation comes from homes and buildings. So it's a really, really important issue. What, but it's a very difficult one to tackle because of the, the fragmented nature of who owns those homes or buildings and who occupies them. So therefore there's often a split between who owns them and who pays the bills. Um, my question is really that therefore this needs a really big program of work to think about how that is addressed because th there are some massive opportunities actually for underemployed or underskilled people to really learn how to do this properly because it's a very technical area I mean, people think about just putting a few rolls of of stuff in your roof but actually that doesn't address the problem most house most loss heat loss is not through conduction it's through convection it's it's a it's a it's re it needs detailed attention, but every time that is bespoke. So we need a skilled workforce. Who's thinking about that? Who's putting that workforce together? Who's, who's technically advising it? Because there's an opportunity here for us to provide um, people to do this all over the country. And they could be very good jobs. Julie? Check. Um, Councillor, just to answer you quickly, I can't answer you specifically on the on your second question, but we've got Mark Atherton from the CA coming to the next meeting to give a full presentation on the green agenda, but specifically including a paper on the retrofitting of, of properties and including the warm homes fund. So if we'll, we've noted down your specific questions and we'll make sure he addresses them when he brings that paper back. Sorry. Do you want to come back to Chair, yeah, I was just going to respond in relation to, um, <coughs> to, to, to the electric vehicles. So, um, again, I think the, the, the paper that you have here uh, is a paper that went to the command authority in May from memory. Um, in terms of the electric vehicle charging infrastructure, we are in the very final stages of a procurement exercise. Members may well recall that there is a... Um, Fleet's the wrong word, I can't think of the right word. The, the, there is a number of electric vehicle charging points already out that have been provided by the public sector. That dates back a good number of years. It was part of government funding under the Plugged in Places programme. We bid for some further uh, funding under what's called the Clean Air Early Measures Fund. And the proposal is that we put a number of... Um, and again, I'm no technician, apologies, but a number of newer generation charging points out there and also look uh, at the charging points that are already out there. Um, so the proposal is that we will probably end up entering into contract with the preferred supplier probably in August. We're in the final knockings of negotiation, so uh, probably not, not say too much at the moment. Um, but th that, that is to roll out uh, a, a further number uh, of charging points and clearly through the procurement process uh, we'll attempt to maximise the value of the money that, that, that we got from central government. Uh, less than 30 and more than 20 but double headers. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. It's 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, two issues. One is around the 6.1 um, sites for housing. Uh, sorry, I missed you. I, I did have to go out. Um, under that, we, we there, there may be an issue on not just about the sustainable side of it. Uh, some councils are in the opposition to other councils. For, for instance, um, Rochdale has been targeted by Serco because we have a low rents and low affordable housing. Under this, we are looking to be the opposite. We need houses of bigger stature, um, higher quality, higher priced houses. And that's the only way we will build up our revenue for the borough because it's one of the lowest at the moment. And that's why Serco target Rochdale to put asylum seekers and other people in our towns um, and especially up the north. So I, I have mentioned this to Paul Dennett when he was signing off the, um, the launch that Monday. He's well aware of the, the problems that we have had mm. on our end. Um, and, on that, and on the homelessness, as you're well aware, well, the staff are, that I chair the Homeless Forum from Rochdale, and I've worked with Andy Burnham from day one on that. We have a couple of issues with regard to trying to allocate homes for, for, for homeless people. And it's because of the allocations policy. So what we're doing now in Rochdale, we're reviewing our allocations prop, uh, policy for the for simple reason. We're finding people in Band A that shouldn't be there and people in Band C and D that should be in Band A. And, and I'm hoping at some time that once we get that clarification, our leader might take that to the GM uh, executive. Okay. Comment? Uh Well, we're asked, therefore, to uh, consider the progress in the achievement of the 2020 ambitions and targets and to note and agree the updated implementation plan performance dashboard. With the comments that have been made, is your wish that uh, that be noted? Thank you. And I now find why it was that uh, I jumped to uh, 12 when it was really 11 earlier in the agenda, because item 10 doesn't exist. So we come then to item 10, which is the housing funding streams, and uh, Steve Fife is here to uh, Thank you, present Chair. and comment. Uh, yes. There. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I'll, I, I'm I, intending to, to run through this um, just reasonably quickly, because it, the, the intention really is to give you a, a kind of overview of the, the funding uh, that comes out of central government uh, and into various things uh, housing related. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll run through it and uh, obviously happy to take questions at the end. Um, there is a kind of question as to how much detail you, 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 you would really be interested in in this. There are lots of little funding streams, but I've focused on the, uh, the main ones uh, that are relevant to, to us um, and particularly on the ones that, that are connected to or aimed at supporting new housing delivery or uh, perhaps indirectly through, through new sales uh, to support new housing delivery. In saying that, I guess I should mention first off that the, the largest uh, sort of single pot, if you like, is it goes through housing benefit or universal credit um, or local housing allowance, uh, which for, for, the, for the, the national total is around 24 billion per annum, which goes through as a subsidy uh, through that route. Um, so if you bear that sort of number in mind when, when you look at the numbers that, that relate to the... Uh, the programs that I'm going through. Uh, I'm using national numbers mainly because they're the, the ones that are clearest, that are easiest to be sure are accurate. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that as I go through. Um, so the first one, uh, and I've, I've ordered these mainly down by size. So the biggest um, sort of funding that goes into housing markets from government is actually uh, through help to buy. And there's various elements of help to buy which are detailed on the slide. But there's around 32 billion has, has gone or, is, or will go into uh, help to buy uh, over the, the 10 years since it was set up in 2013. Um, we in GM or, or you in districts have no control, no influence over that because they're entirely demand led. So individual households will be applying for help to buy equity loans or saving through the help to buy ISA scheme, which is now the lifetime ISA scheme. Uh, but the government is is putting some significant funds through uh, those routes. Um, that 32 billion there is 
the, the, the logic behind that is, is to help people to, uh, to get into home ownership, and that's, that's you know, a, a widely shared uh, objective uh, across the piece. Um, but it's not strategic in, in any kind of spatial sense. There's nothing that we can do geographically to, to increase the amount of that funding that's flowing into Greater Manchester, other than by increasing the price of our houses, which probably isn't something that we want to be doing. But um, we know that there are significant funds coming in uh, so through the uh, Help to Buy Equity Loan, we know there are about over 7,000 loans have come into uh, GM over the last five years. Um, value of that about 275 million. So significant sums of cash uh, coming in uh, to Greater Manchester through that route. Um, second one, which is which is a very different one, and, and is as the successor to a, a series of funding programs that have been going for a very long time. Um, in my day, it was, used to be called the old affordable development program of the, the housing corporation, but it's now the shared ownership and affordable homes program, um, really rolls off the tongue, uh, which is run nationally, 11 billion uh, in the current sort of six year time slot. And that's the funding that is probably familiar to most of you. That's, that's the grant that housing associations and other social housing, housing providers, including local authorities, uh, where you're a, a, a still a registered housing provider, uh, can access to support new build uh, and in some cases conversions uh, so that uh, to, to, to uh, deliver affordable homes of various kinds and, and that's, that's one of the issues that, that members might want to think about. The products that are covered um, under that programme now include affordable rent which is set at around 80% of market rent, it includes shared ownership, uh, it includes rent to buy products. Uh, it does now again include uh, funding for social rent, uh, which it hadn't for a while. Um, there's now two billion nationally available for social rent uh, grant funded schemes. Uh, however, if you look at that last bullet point, there's a little catch uh, for five of GM districts which aren't eligible for that specific element of it. So all 10 districts are eligible for uh, accessing the, the affordable rent, the shared ownership and so on but only five which are judged according to a formula to have the highest affordability pressures um, are eligible to uh, receive grant for social rented schemes. And that, that judgment is, down, is based on the gap between uh, sort of affordable rents and private sector rents, uh, which need to be more than 50 pounds per week to qualify according to the formula. So the five where, where that, that social rent uh, funding is available are, are Bury, Manchester, Salford, Stockport and Trafford. Um, so that, that, is a, that is undoubtedly a restriction and something that, that we uh, have made representations to government about. Um, the, the point above that around strategic partnerships is an interesting development recently. Uh, that allows uh, specific housing providers who've, who've entered into a sort of longer term relationship with Homes England to get longer term funding. Um, and that's actually quite helpful to them in terms of negotiating on sites, uh, putting build programs together that they're not left in what has traditionally been a sort of three-year cycle of funding. Um, those are now extending out to 2024 and again to 2029 uh, in the relatively near future. So that, that allows those uh, associations a bit more uh, flexibility in terms of how they're building their future programs of new development. Um, in and around Greater Manchester, Great Places uh, Housing Group, who would be familiar to many of you, uh, have a strategic partnership relationship which they're looking to extend to involve a few other Greater Manchester housing providers. Uh, L&Q, who are now uh, are taking in the process of taking over Trafford Housing Trust, also are one of those strategic partners. So that, that gives them pot potentially additional uh, funding and easier access, if you like, to funding uh, from Homes England, uh, which is useful to us. Um, third on the list is the Housing Infrastructure Fund. That's, that's 5.5 billion nationally. Um, was announced in 2016 um, and has, has been through a, an application process. So it was a kind of one-off opportunity, if you like, to put bids in um, under two headings. Uh, one, the, uh, the larger schemes, the forward funding, as it was termed, uh, which is run in part through the combined authorities, including GM, and then the marginal viability fund, which is for smaller schemes, but that was directly applied uh, by districts direct to Homing, Homes England. Um, we were actually reasonably successful. If you compare us to other northern kind of city regions, if you like, we did pretty well in that, that bidding process. Um, the marginal viability schemes, uh, around 65 million, 69 million, sorry, 
uh, across uh, one, two, three, four, I think seven districts. Uh, the, the bigger schemes, the forward funding schemes, there were three successful in the initial stage and they're still going through uh, due diligence processes with Homes England uh, at the next kind of state level of detail. So we're awaiting announcements which we believe will be in the autumn about hopefully those being uh, finally confirmed. So that, that's a scheme, a uh, joint scheme between Bolton and Wigan uh, and two schemes, one in Manchester, one in Salford. Uh, so they're kind of work underway if you like. What we don't know yet is whether that housing infrastructure fund will be uh, extended or repeated that opportunity. That's very that's been very important to us because it's it gives us an opportunity to bid for, as the name suggests, physical infrastructure um, that will help us to unlock uh, house building, uh, and that's that's that funding has been sort of uh, hard to come by in, in recent years. So we would like to see that repeated, uh, if at all possible. Um, Number four, um, the Home Building Fund is a big national program. I, I won't talk about it for very long because there's the GM uh, Housing Investment Loan Fund which effectively does the same job. Um, the national fund was set, off, set up after uh, the GM one, so we, we like to think that that was them learning from, from Greater Manchester. But um, uh, it, it is still accessible to projects in Greater Manchester, um, so it's potentially a backstop there where the GM fund, uh, for whatever reason, couldn't in, uh, invest in a, in a specific scheme. But it's, it's probably less relevant to us than it is uh, elsewhere in the country. So I'll, I'll run straight on to the next two, and these are, these are slightly mysterious, if I'm being honest. These are relatively recent uh, programmes. The Small Sites Fund, uh, which is 750 million nationally uh, from uh, last year, and the Land Assembly Fund, 1.3 billion. Uh, the Land Assembly Fund is basically funding for Homes England themselves to acquire land uh, that needs uh, some investment uh, to bring it ready to the market. Uh, we've got quite a good relationship with, with Homes England uh, locally in GM. They work in, in a lot of detail with us on, on a lot of schemes with, with district colleagues. So uh, that to us seems like a, a positive development. I'm not sure how far 1.3 billion will stretch uh, across, across the whole of England, but um, we'll certainly do our best to make uh, the best use of that one. The Small Science Fund, again, seems like a good idea. Uh, it's open to, to business and, and I'm sure colleagues in districts will be uh, talking to Homes England about opportunities we have to use that. Um, we'll see how that goes. I think that's one of those funds that probably government will extend if it, if it seems to be uh, producing positive results. So, so we're hopeful on that one. Um, and then the States Regeneration Fund, this is an interesting one which um, kind of illustrates some of the problems that, that we have in accessing funding in, in Greater Manchester. So. This grew out of um, largely London-based experience where um, uh, local authorities or housing associations were uh, increasing the density of, of social housing um, estates, maybe putting a lot of market uh, sale units on, using the values that you can generate in London to increase housing supply, diversify some issues around um, whether they were returning the amount of affordable and social housing that perhaps was in the uh, schemes originally but it's, it's a model that's very much built on using the value in, in the land that's in and around social housing estates. Clearly in, in the Greater Manchester or Northern context, that's, that's quite a hard sum to make add up. Um, the, the main stream of funding under that program is loan finance, so it's, it's dependent on uh, the schemes that come forward actually in effect paying for themselves in the, in the long term. And that's a huge challenge uh, in, in most of Greater Manchester. Um, we have accessed some of the revenue funding that came along with it to, uh, to sort of do some initial preparatory work and, and try to work through what the potential for regeneration in, in, in specific estates has been. Um, but it then leads us to, to look at other funding sources as, as a way to probably take those forward. So an illustration maybe of the, the kind of national uh, programs perhaps not hitting the, uh, the uh, approaches that we would want uh, to see in Greater Manchester. Um, so before I go on to, to, to uh, talk about the geographical issue more generally, a couple of other things to be aware of. Um, uh, there's the, there's a, a smaller fund, the Care and Support Specialised Housing Fund, or CASH for short, uh, which is aimed at uh, encouraging housing associations to develop speci uh, specialised housing, supported housing, um, in conjunction with uh, health and social care colleagues. We've been pushing uh, associations to, to make some progress on that. That was 
uh, rather stalled by changes to uh, housing benefit rules uh, recent, uh, sort of three or four years ago. That issue has now been resolved. So we're not quite seeing the kind of acceleration of delivery of those, those schemes that we would have hoped would have come when that, that issue was resolved. So perhaps something to look out for locally if there are schemes, uh, perhaps supported housing schemes for older households, but also for uh, others with specialised housing needs, that there is funding around for that. Uh, and Homes England colleagues are quite keen that we, we make use of that. And there's also another fund, Community Housing Fund, uh, which is available at the moment for community-led housing, so housing cooperatives, other models of community-led housing. We are doing some work uh, to try and set up an advisory hub um, for community housing groups uh, within GM. Uh, and there's another little bit of money that we're trying to bid to, to help us uh, put that together in terms of the capacity that that, that requires because we haven't got an expert in community housing uh, within the CA. But I'll take you on to, um, and I'm not sure why the headings are suddenly smaller there, but an issue that we, uh, there was an announcement made um, last year, um, slightly under the, under the radar, uh, that, that a series of Homes England programmes, the ones that I've been talking about, would be uh, targeted geographically at the areas of highest affordability pressure. Um, so not entirely. So the, the, the formula they're using is that 80% of the funds under these programs uh, will be targeted at areas with those highest affordability pressures. Um, there's only four local authority areas in the north of England as a whole who qualify for that. So we, we've got one, we've got Trafford. Uh, the others are, are uh, South Lakeland and Hamilton Harrogate in, in Yorkshire. So what that means effectively is that the 20% that's left is available to the, to the nine uh, remaining GM authorities to bid for and under those programs. So the, the bigger schemes under Housing Infrastructure Fund, the State's Regeneration Fund that I was just talking about, Home Building Fund, which again, we've got the GM fund, so maybe that's not so much of an issue for us. And then the new ones, the Small Sites Fund and the Land Assembly Fund. Um, so if you, if you put that on a map, this is, what it looks like. The, the blue areas are the ones that are in the, uh, in the 20 percent and, and the red are the ones that are in the, the 80 percent. We've called that a heat map to show where the, the funding is concentrated. And actually it's, yes, there is the north-south divide there, but some, some surprising perhaps places in the south as well, places like Plymouth and uh, Southampton that, that don't fall into the 80 percent nationally. Um, so that is a, an issue for us. That's something that, that we've written to, to the Minister about, and, and I know Paul Dennett and others have, have made representations about this. Um, it's, it's still uh, in, the, uh, in the rules of the, of the game as far as Homes England colleagues are uh, consider, consider it at the moment. Um, there, is a, there is a feeling that actually for many of those programmes, that 2080 balance is probably not that far from what the allocations were actually turning out to be. Um, but we'll, we'll need to see how that plays out over time as, as, as we go through. Um, <coughs> so finishing with the, the best for last, if you like, in terms of this is, this is the funding that we control uh, here in Greater Manchester, the uh, Housing Investment Loan Fund. Um, we've got that through one of the devolution deals. We've got a 10-year, 300 million fund, which we revolve around. Um, it's available for schemes that are led by the private sector. Uh, and it is, it's, it's money that we're lending and, and intending to get paid back. Um, and when it's paid back, we can reinvest it and recycle it. So we're aiming to get it round two and a half, maybe three times if we can within the 10 year period. Uh, and it's also generating some surpluses now, which we, we can retain and we can use to support our own housing objectives. So the conditions for the funding are, are sort of there. Uh, if you want more detail, Andrew McIntosh, I think is due to come and talk uh, to the committee at a future meeting who's the, who's the guy who's, who's running that, that scheme. So he can give you chapter and verse, but uh, it, would be, uh, it would be daft not to mention it as it's the one that's most under our control. As you see at the bottom there, we've committed over 420 million of that because we're getting uh, repayments back from the early schemes already. Um, that will allow us to deliver more than 5,000 or allow private sector developers who are borrowing that funding to, to de deliver over 5,000 units. Uh, on 40 sites across Greater Manchester. So uh, that's the kind of the quick run through. In terms of next steps for us, um, Homes England uh, issued a new strategic plan uh, last year uh, for the period up to 2023 that talks about uh, working with uh, what they call priority areas to support 
housing delivery. Uh, they are very clear that Greater Manchester to them is one of those priority areas. So we're, we're in, a, in an ongoing dialogue as to how we can translate that kind of sentiment into uh, some useful uh, flexibilities and investment and encouragement to housing delivery in Greater Manchester. But that, those conversations are ongoing, but positive, I'd say, at the moment. Thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. A couple of things, please, sir. The Small Sites Fund and the Land Assembly Fund, um, if, if, I'm getting, if, I, if I'm wrong, correct me. Would this help, you know, where we're trying to build on um, brownfield sites rather than greenfield sites um, to, to build up our quota in each council? Um, would this sort of funding help get onto these sites that nobody else wants? Um, to take this this piece of land and, and work it to poor homes so it can add to our quota and if that's the case how do we get into it what's the criteria for, for, for the application for these two particular funds funding streams that's that one and on the other one the uh, 150 units at 40 sites I haven't got a clue where they are are we entitled to know where they are please Chair, if I might, yes. Um, on the Small Sites Fund and the Land Assembly Fund, uh, I think the answer to the question is yes. To me, particularly the word, the key word grant funding uh, on the Small Sites Fund particularly means it is in, it should be helping us bring forward some of those smaller, and we do have lots and lots of smaller brownfield sites around Greater Manchester. Uh, the way to access it is to get your officers to speak to Homes England if they aren't already to see what the, the processes are. Uh, it, is, it is open, it is there to, uh, to fund schemes that can spend by March 2021, which isn't actually that far away, so that might be one of the ways of picking which, which sites you might want to push through that route, because that's quite a short time scale for all things housing. Um, sorry, and on your second point, yes. Um, yes, we can get you a list. Um, the schemes are approved by the combined authority at the public meetings, so um, if you're very painstaking, you can go through all the C meeting, uh, meeting papers, but I won't let you. I won't let you make you do that. We'll get a list to you. We'll share the list. Once they're sorted, will you be starting another list? <laughs> Colleagues are always looking for more schemes to fund. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Greater Manchester Housing Investment Loan Fund, the 300 million. Uh, is that for affordable schemes only in Greater Manchester? I know we don't, I know the GMCA doesn't have a definition of affordability, if I'm right. Um, we would consider it 8% of the market rate in Manchester, but, um, you know, is that for a, what one would consider affordable or could Fred Dunn, for example, put in an application for, for some money? Yeah, thank you. No, it's, it's not pointed at affordable housing schemes specifically. Um, the way it operates is it's, it's the intention is to speed up, to accelerate housing delivery in general. Um, the affordable housing elements of it, and it is a question that we ask every time, is determined largely by the district that the scheme is in. So it, 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 the schemes need to conform with or ideally uh, exceed uh, the affordable uh, home requirement that the local authority involved would would uh, put on the scheme. Um, we're there to, to fund it and to accelerate housing delivery, but uh, rest assured that that is a question that we ask for every scheme. And if we don't ask it, the portfolio holder uh, asks it. Further comments, questions from the report? We're not core, so all we can do is note the report at this point. Okay, we move then to uh, next item, which is uh, the work programme. And you have a draft uh, with the papers. Do you want to speak to it, please, uh, Joanne? Thanks, Chair. Uh, following on from the informal briefing session that we had last time, um, we took on board member suggestions and we populated a draft work programme for the year 1920. Obviously, um, the, it, the issues are the same, but the timings of them may change due to people being able to attend, etc., and reports going via the CA and the timetable there. 
just to note on the one in front of you, uh, you have Town Centre Strategy Mayoral Development Corporation down for September. We've actually confirmed that the Mayor's able to attend in November, so that one will be moved to November. Um, and also, a few of the things that have been mentioned tonight, retrofitting, we, we have down. Um, also, um, the including the green agenda in the town centre, uh, sorry, in the retrofit. So basically it's for members to have a look through and see if there's anything on there that they want to add or delete or comment on, basically, Chair. Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think the one about the, um, the bed every night being in January, I think we need one before them. Now that Andy's decided it's going to be run from July to July, for the next 12 months that he's, he's put the funding forward for that. I think we need an interim report on that halfway through the year, so it needs to be before January. Maybe, Chair, we might be able to fit it into the November meeting then, because obviously the Mayor's able to attend then, so we'll, we'll see what we can do. Thanks, Chair. fairly fluid, and there will be yeah. changes uh, as the year goes on. But if there are additional items that members feel strongly we ought to uh, consider, if you let the officers know, and we will look at the programme. Um, as we've seen tonight, there are items which uh, disappear from the programme at short notice because of uh, non-availability of officers. So we just need to have some schemes in reserve, some proposals. So please bring your comments forward. <coughs> Item uh, 13, the dates of future meetings, we have uh, had a discussion on that and therefore I suggest that they remain extant and we will consider changes during the year if necessary. But for the time being, those are the substantive dates. Uh, and that being the whole of business, can I thank you for your attendance and declare the meeting closed.